Welcome. Today we're going to be talking about um, psychological theory and assessment. This is really going to be a big review from your educational psychology class. So, so today we'll review behaviorism, social cognitive theory, cognitive constructivism, social constructivism, information processing theory, and socioculturalist theories. So first off, behaviorism. What do you remember about behaviorism? Okay, so remember that behaviorism is learning equals a change in behavior. So when you think about classical conditioning, you should be thinking about um, Pavlov. Remembering that it occurs when a neutral object comes to elicit specific responses that may be unique to an individual. So it occurs when we have an association of a neutral object with a meaningful stimulus. So we have that bell and food. So a dog salivates when he has food. Then we ring the bell when the food is presented. Um, and then um, when we ring the bell, then the dog salivates just by the ringing of the bell, right? So Pavlov. So in classical conditioning, that neural, neutral stimulus occurs during the behavior. So classical conditioning, um, the stimulus and the behavior occur at the same time. We have reinforcement and punishment. So we're thinking about that operant conditioning, right? So thinking about Skinner. So we have um, reinforcements and um, positive and negative reinforcement. So that's when we're increasing behaviors. So we have positive reinforcement with rewards and positive feedback, and negative reinforcement when we escape discomfort, when that discomfort is removed. And punishment is when we decrease the behavior. So presentation punishment, when we um, have reprimands, we um, have satiation, and negative punishments and removal punishment, um, response costs, social isolation, so things like timeout, right? So remember that in operant conditioning, the reinforcement or, behavior or punishment occurs after the behavior, so as a consequence, right? So we see this a lot in schools. Um, it's based upon a behaviorist framework. So we see positive reinforcement when we do things like give candy for good behavior, um, punishment when we um, give discipline. Um, we see a lot of things like negative punishment when we put kids in timeout to decrease the behavior. Um, or if we want to reward a behavior by giving kids a homework pass, right, that would be negative reinforcement. We're removing a discomfort. Um, what is the purpose of assessment in regards to behaviorism? So if we're only regarding um, learning as a change in behavior, how are we thinking about assessment in that way? We're only measuring that change in behavior. So even if we're thinking about learning as a change of behavior on a test, um, a lot of what we're thinking about in the current state of schools might be linked to behaviorism. So we think about our current state of accountability and behaviorism. So we're only measuring student learning not by um, what's happening inside a kid's head, but only on that performance on that test. So did they improve from their third grade test to their fourth grade test? That would be a measure of change in behavior. And we reward students and teachers in schools based upon that change in behavior, and we punish them when they don't have that change, and we see a negative change, right? So um, really, that whole state of accountability is based upon behaviorism, in my opinion, right? OK, moving on to social cognitive theory. What do you remember about social cognitive theory? Hopefully, you thought about Albert Bandura. And remember that in social cognitive theory, we're thinking about learning as a change in mental processes that creates a capacity to, to demonstrate different behaviors. So we're adding that additional component. We're not just thinking about change in behavior, but we're also thinking about that change in mental processes that changes behaviors. And that change can also be caused by observing others. So we're not just learning by things that happen to us, but what we see in our environment, hence the social cognitive piece. So we have this idea of reciprocal causation. So this idea that we have um, behavioral, personal, environmental determinants. So we already know about the environmental and the behavioral determinants, right? So we have a change in our behavior that's caused by your environment, right? By a punishment or a reward. We also have personal determinants, how we feel, right? So if I have a teacher that says, wow, you did a really great job, you're really smart, then I'm gonna feel better about myself. And in return, I'm gonna do better in my math because I feel better about myself. That's a personal determinant. So in social cognitive theory, I'm also concerned about that internal state. 
I'm concerned about those affective characteristics. So this week, or next week in our lab, we'll be talking about affective characteristics, and that'll be really tied to that social cognitive theory. We're going to be thinking about those personal determinants and how that might affect our behavioral determinants, how that might affect our students' um, behavior in class, and how they perform on our tests and our assessments. So in social cognitive theory, what's the purpose of assessment? We'll be thinking really not only on their change in their behavior, the change that they might have on their achievement, but also how those internal um, cognitive aspects might be changed and how their social context might also be changed. So if they see how others are doing in that social context and how that might affect how they feel about themselves. The next model is informational processing model. So what do you remember about IPT or information processing? So remember the information processing model is the model that's a lot like a computer. So we start off with information that's out in our environment, right? And that's all external to us. And we have our internal self, our frame of reference. We have input that's coming in, right? All the time, input coming in. And that goes to our sensory register, all of our receptors that record our senses, our eyes, our ears, our, our skin, our nose. And we're perceiving and we're attending. To, we're perceiving all of it, but we're only attending to some of it, right? And that goes, things we're attending to go to our working memory. And remember, our working memory is pretty small. It can only hold a certain amount of information and only for a little bit amount of time, right? And that's what, what's in our working memory is what we're executing operations on, right? So right now your working memory is holding in it um, my voice, the information I'm talking about, right? Maybe what you're writing down in your notes. To keep something in our working memory, we have to rehearse it. We maybe are saying it over and over again in our head. Like if you want to remember someone's phone number, you say those digits over and over again in your head, right? Um, but after a while, it will decay. It will no longer be in our working memory if we don't work to rehearse it, right? And we can also have interference, right? We've all experienced this. We're trying to remember a phone number and our annoying little brother comes in and starts saying other random numbers and we've forgotten the numbers we were supposed to remember, right? If we want to, to keep something longer than just our working memory, we have to encode it into our long-term memory, right? And we know that there are three parts of our long-term um, relatively permanent memory. There's declarative, procedural, and conditional memory, right? And we know that it, those are stored in different parts of our brain. So we keep our knowledge, our declarative knowledge, the things that we know, and then the things we know how to do, that's our procedural memory. And the conditional is knowing when to know which things. So that's how when some people have amnesia or they've had, um, they've gotten hit on the head or they have amnesia, right? They might not remember the word bicycle or what a bicycle is called, but if you gave them a bicycle, they might remember how to ride it. So that procedural knowledge was stored in a different place of their brain than that declarative knowledge, right? So we have information stored in our long-term memory. Um, and then I ask you to retrieve it. I ask you about a question. No, oh, and that long-term memory has interference and decay. So again, after a while, if I don't use information, I might forget it, right? So we've experienced this. It's been a very long time since I took my uh, U.S. history course, so I might have forgotten some of the battles of the Civil War, right? And there's interference, right? So I'll remember all of your beautiful faces this year, but as I have more students in the coming semesters, I might forget some faces as they get replaced, right? So. Then, as I've asked you, I mentioned the Civil War, right? And so some of you have been trying to retrieve the name of battles from the Civil War from your long-term memory. And some of you might be successful at retrieving that information from your long-term memory. And now it's in your working memory. And you're going to tell me the names of those battles, right? And again, if you can remember, it's going to go from your working memory to a response generator. So now you could say them or you could write them down on a sheet of paper, right? Into some output. And so all of these processes are managed by executive control processes, this metacognition that plan and run each step of this information processing. So a lot of times when students have difficulty learning, we attribute it to executive control malfunction. So those could be things like um, autism, ADHD, um, some of those um, difficulties with executive control in the frontal lobes of our brains, right? And we'll talk a lot more about those types of disabilities um, near the end of our semester. So the information processing model is really like this computer model of the brain, thinking about how we input and output information, how it's stored in our brain in different parts. 
So what's the purpose of assessment in IPT? When we're thinking about assessment in information processing theory, we're really thinking about how the brain retrieves and stores information. Um, and if we're thinking about learning, right, we're thinking about that chunking of information and how to use mnemonic devices to retrieve it. So we're really thinking about declarative and procedural knowledge and how we can assess those different kinds. So we'll use IPT theory when we're talking about content knowledge instruments in a couple of weeks. So now we'll move on to constructivism, and there's two types, right? There's cognitive and social constructivism. So when we think about cognitive constructivism, who's the big name that we're thinking about? Uh, hopefully you said Piaget, right? Here's a picture of uh, Jean Piaget. And he's really thinking about the process of continuous adaptation. Remember, he was a developmental psychologist, so he's really thinking about learning as a developmental process. So this idea of continuous adaptation. So remember, we have this initial scheme about the world, and we're at this state of equilibrium. And then we have some sort of new experience, whether it's a physical or social experience, that leads us to a state of disequilibrium. Now we're in a new, we're kind of off kilter. We, we have something new. We have to figure out what to do with it, right? And this is our engine of development, these new experiences, this disequilibrium. We have two choices. We can either assimilate or accommodate that information. Um, if we assimilate it, we incorporate it into our existing scheme. We just add it in there. And accommodate means we modify it and put it into, we have to modify our scheme in order to change it so our new experience fits in. And that's our mechanism of development. And once we've done that, then we're in a new state of equilibrium. So how does this work? So let's say that I am a, I'm a toddler, and at my house we have a dog. So I think that all four-legged furry animals are dogs, right? So I go next door, and they have um, they have a four-legged furry animal with little pointy ears, and it says meow to me. And I say, oh, wow, a new thing. And um, so I'm at a state of disequilibrium, right? And I say, oh, look, a cat, or a dog. Look, a dog. And it says meow to me. And my parents say, oh, no, that's not a dog. That's a cat, right? So at first, I assimilated, right? I took that new creature, and I put it into my, new, my existing scheme. I said, look. That is a four-legged creature. It's a dog, right? And then my parents said, no, wait, maybe um, that's not a dog. Maybe that's a cat. So now I had to change, right? I had to change my scheme. So now I have two things. I have dogs and I have cats, right? I had to change and accommodate. So that's an example of how we can use um, cognitive, cognitive constructivism and how we, how, the, how we learn in a really naturalistic developmental way. So if we're thinking about learning in the sense of cognitive constructivism, how is that different than IPT? How do we conceptualize learning differently? In constructivism, we're really thinking about conceptual understanding. We're less concerned about the details and the nitty gritty and the retrieval of information, and we're more concerned with how do people understand, have a conceptual understanding, a deep understanding of that concept, of that schema, right? So we're going to be thinking about and assessing things in a completely different way in constructivism, right? Um, and now we'll move on to social constructivism. So who's the big name we think of with social constructivism? Oh, I hope you said Vygotsky, right? So Vygotsky was in Russia, and he was reading Piaget's early work. Um, and he created a whole new framework. And we usually think of Vygotsky as coming really after Piaget, but they were really pretty contemporary. It's just that Vygotsky was writing in Russian, and no one could read it in the Western world, so it took us a while to catch up to his work. So he thought of learning as a development of the mind through language and social interaction. So he loved what Piaget said, but he had added on to it thinking about how that learning is mediated through language and through our interactions with others. So culture mediates that learning because the way that we interpret language and our social interactions um, help us learn. So there's kind of four big points to Vygotsky's work. He talked about internalization and private speech. So those are the ways in which we talk to ourselves and we learn, right? And I know none of you are going to admit that you talk to yourselves, but that private speech is what we do. Um, remember how when you were learning to drive a car, and you had to like think about every single step of that process. So you're like, okay, so I'm gonna switch lanes. So the first thing I do is uh, put on my turn signal. 
Now I'm going to check my mirror, and I'm going to check my other mirror, and I'm going to look behind me, and then I'm going to check my mirror again, and then I'm going to slowly move over, right? And now when you switch lanes, you just kind of do it automatically, right? That's that internalization. You start off with private speech and, and narrating to yourself, and now you now it's automatic, right? Okay. Um, what about zone of proximal development? Sometimes we call that ZPD. Um, what does that mean? Right? Z zone of proximal development is that sweet spot of learning, right? It's that... Um, level of instruction where students can learn maximally, where it's not too easy and it's not too hard, it's just right. And they're at that zone of proximal development when we can provide scaffolding, right? That's that additional support we can provide for students to help them learn. So we think about social constructivism. Um, when we're thinking about um, social constructivism, it's going to be a lot of the same types of assessments as we would Okay, sorry, I had to stop for a minute. They were um, mowing the lawn by my window and it was really loud. Okay, so when we're thinking about social constructivism, our conceptions of assessment are gonna be really similar. We're gonna be thinking about the same types of things. Assessment of a large conceptual framework. We might be a little more concerned about the language that the students are using and that social environment that they're using. Okay, so the next piece will be, uh, let's see. Sociocultural theories, right? And I know it's confusing. We've got social cognitive theory, social constructivism, and sociocultural theories. So make sure you get those um, three really straight in your heads. So sociocultural theories um, is really that apprenticeship model, right? Learning children as apprentices in thinking, active in their efforts to learn from observing and participating with their peers and more skilled members of their society to construct new solutions within the context of sociocultural activity. So this is really based upon um, sociology and thinking about the ways in which people across lots of different cultures have learned. So this is that apprenticeship model. Um, so we have, we start off with some sort of culturally valued activity, right? And we have a novice, right? A little smiley face there. And they're actively attempting to make sense of a new situation, responsible for putting themselves in a position to learn. So let's think about you as a novice teacher. You're actively putting yourself in a situation to learn how to become a teacher, right? And then you have a skilled partner, right? You have lots of skilled partners. You have your mentor teachers, you have your professors, and um, your skilled partners are finding effective ways to achieve shared learning, um, stretching your understanding, and structuring sub goals, right? So they're modeling, they're giving you both um, tacit and explicit communication. So sometimes your mentor teacher is saying, I'm doing this because blah, 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 right? And other times they're just showing you the way to teach, right? They're just tacitly showing you this is the way teachers do things with supported structuring, right? Um, and then you have a groups of novices. You're not doing this by yourself, right? You have all of your peers, your resources for one another, you aid and challenge each other. So you have all of these guys, all of your classmates that you're experiencing this all together with, right? Oh, I don't know how many there are. There's a lot of these. Okay. Um, so so we we think about this apprenticeship model and learning as, as teachers. We also do this with, with learning how to read, right? Um, we have our, our students in our classroom, and then as a teacher, I might say, these are the things that readers do, right? We start at the top of the page, and we read from left to right. We look at the pictures on the page to get context clues. We start with the first sound of a word and try to sound it out, right? Or I might say, as a scientist, this is what scientists do when they're in a lab, or this is what a mathematician does when they solve a problem, right? So we use the apprenticeship model a lot in our classrooms. And um, if I'm thinking about the apprenticeship model in instruction or as, as assessment tools, I'm really going to be thinking about how do we use authentic assessments? How do I use assessments that think about the real world skills that in these culturally valued activities and how are they related to the real world? Um, so those are all of our psychological theories that we're just g giving a basic review of today. You're going to be needing to use these in our lab exam our lab activities for this semester, so make sure that you're really paying attention to these um, and that you review them from this class and then also from your educational psychology class that you should have had previously. And that'll help form the foundations for your lab activities. Um, great.